The next presentation is going to be on opportunities for biosecurity, risk reduction in synthetic biology. Opportunities for biosecurity risk reduction in synthetic biology. And this is going to be delivered by James Deegan from uh, Twist Bioscience. So James Deegan leads the biosecurity program at Twist Bioscience, a DNA synthesis company based in the United States. He holds a PhD from George Mason University in computational biology and bioinformatics and has worked in target uh, discovery, molecular diagnostic development, and biodefense. His research has included methods for adaptive detection of biological weapons release, machine learning based cancer diagnosis, and novel algorithmic approaches to discerning intent in oligonucleotide length DNA synthesis requests. At Twist Bioscience, he leads development and operation of Twist's biosecurity screening system and trade compliance programs to power safe, secure silicon-based DNA synthesis at record scale. Uh, please join me to welcome uh, James Diggins to give us the next talk. the conference organizers for your invitation. I'm sorry, I, I can't be there in uh, person today, but hopefully at the South Africa, I'll hope to see you all in person. Um, today, uh, I wanna talk about uh, biosecurity risk reduction kind of in the context of synthetic biology and specifically uh, DNA synthesis. So Twist, uh, if you haven't heard of Twist, that's a company in the United States on the West Coast. Uh, we manufacture DNA. And the big distinction of between Twist and other companies in that space is really one of scale. So we make DNA on a silicon chip and in the same form factor as a 96 well plastic plate where you, existing technologies might be able to make one gene, Twist can make about 10,000. So there's an issue of, um, you know, can biosecurity systems keep up with that increase in scale of about three orders of magnitude? So with that silicon platform, we make genes, most of which I'll talk about today, um, but also oligo pools. We make variant libraries, kits for uh, sequencing, and we also have a, a program to actually store digital data in DNA, since it's a very stable molecule chemically. So when we talk about biosecurity at Twist, this is in the context of gene length sequences, and over the last nine months, we've made about a quarter of a million genes. And so you can imagine having to make a biosecurity related decision about each one of those genes as they come in. And functionally what that looks like is um, kind of two thrusts. One, screening the customer to make sure we sort of trust the customer, we understand their background, that they understand what, um, you know, what they're going to do with the material that we're selling them. And then screening the actual sequence itself. So DNA, um, you know, considered a dual use material, can certainly be used for all sorts of positive outcomes, can also uh, potentially be used to cause harm. So we wanna make sure that we understand what we're making and who we're making it for before we produce that material. So the sequence screening portion of that activity is really looking at, you know, is that sequence unique to a pathogen, bacterial or viral? Uh, if it is, is it from a gene that can actually participate in pathogenicity? So that's a, a fundamental question in terms of it, is it regulated or not? Is it legal to manufacture and ship within the United States? Do we have to have a license to ship it overseas? These systems have to answer all of those questions and they have to do it quickly. So in the context of, of 250,000 genes over the next over the past nine months, um, you know, are there opportunities here to make these systems better, to reduce the risk that we sell DNA that could be misused? And I think the first shortcoming I, I want to point out is the lack of annotation around these sequences. So most of the regulatory frameworks focus on the organism level and for um, you know, control of samples 
and access to these pathogens, that's incredibly important. When you go down a level and start talking about which components of these organisms are related to pathogenicity, there really isn't much in the way of high quality, publicly available annotation. And that makes looking for those sequences really difficult. In addition, it also makes understanding how much you can edit those sequences and still have pathogenic functionality incredibly difficult. So for example, Twist customers are often ordering pieces of genes, not just full genes. And for us to be able to assess the risk of a certain synthesis, we have to understand what the functional domains are in those proteins and whether the customer is ordering sequence that would maintain those functional domains or whether they would break them up. Or even whether there are several, you know, small edits to the sequence that would destroy the functionality of the protein. And as you might imagine, those kinds of decisions are all very specific to individual proteins. You can't make generalized uh, recommendations around, you know, if it's 90% identical, then the functionality is destroyed. That's just not true. So the complete lack in the public space of really good, high quality annotation all the way down to the functional domain level, um, I think is a real gap in how we practice sort of a biosecurity at the molecular scale now. And that's something that, you know, governments and other organizations could come together and solve and just hasn't, hasn't been solved yet. The second uh, piece here would be to expand the existing biosecurity practices that aim at gene link synthesis to two sort of emerging or new areas. And the first would be benchtop synthesis devices. So there are several companies right now that are trying to create um, small form factor devices that can make DNA, sort of DNA printers. Um, those devices would be extremely useful. They would, they would um, allow for uh, local synthesis of DNA. The problem is that you have to make sure that those devices are still responsible in terms of what DNA they're willing to make. And they're not going to, you know, upon request, manufacture smallpox or some other um, organism. So that's a real challenge is to make sure those biosecurity processes go down all the way into these small devices. The second piece there is oligo pools. So these are pools of short pieces of DNA. And with current technology, we can make pools that are quite large, so over a million unique pieces of DNA. And we use those same pools to make genes. You know, that's how DNA synthesis companies make genes. They make oligos and they assemble them into genes. Right now, those oligo pools are not screened at all. So we need to come up with ways to assess whether you could use an oligo pool thermodynamically to build a gene. And then if you could, then screen that gene sequence through traditional uh, sequence screening routes. And I, I put here a reference to the DropSynth set of papers, which um, is an is a easier way of using oligonucleotide pools to assemble genes. And so the bar for how technically difficult that is has come has come down quite far. The third would be structured red teaming. So in the context of sort of what I do, you know, we build these complex systems that try and screen DNA to determine if it has any role in pathogenicity. We think we did a good job, but how do you know? Um, especially since in the biosecurity context, there's a huge breadth of organization of organisms that we're looking at. Those organisms are all different. They're all annotated to different degrees in the public domain. You know, some like Bacillus anthracis are incredibly well annotated, and then there are some uh, pathogenic fungi that are barely annotated at all. So does your detection capacity span all of the organisms that you should re really be able to detect? And the question of how to, how to gauge the performance of the system you built is a hard one. One of the things I think we've come upon is red teaming, which is essentially asking someone to break your system, you know, telling a really, um, a person skilled in the art to go ahead and try order, ordering something that they shouldn't be allowed to have and see if it gets through. Um, I think red teaming is applicable much more broadly. So if you have a set of policies and procedures that are meant to control access, you can red team those as well. Uh, you know, you can ask someone, try and get around it and then have them report back and say, this worked, this didn't work. And so it's a good way to, to kind of probe for weaknesses in a set of defenses that you've set up. And uh, recently, there was a, a paper published in Nature Biotech that I have a, a screenshot from here where 
some researchers from Ben Gurion University um, sort of covertly tried to go to synthesis companies and order sequences using you know methods that they thought would obfuscate the sequences and get through screening. Um, and and for their troubles, they got a Nature Biotech paper, and so that's kind of a pretty strong inducement to other groups to say, you know, why don't you try the, some of the same things? And and so when I say structured red teaming, the suggestion there is that we do this in a structured way rather than having kind of an all call for people to just start aiming at systems like this. And this is a good way also to talk about a certification framework for these biosecurity systems. You know, how do we know that it's doing what we ask? Well, red team is a good way to uh, to assert that. Um, I think one thing we're seeing at Twist that's sort of an emerging concern is the sheer number of totally unknown sequences that we're asked to make. So right now, in any given month, about 20 to 35 percent of the sequences that are ordered from us have no homology uh, to any sequence, in uh, you know very large reference databases, and. And the question there is, how do you even begin to do biosecurity risk assessment for a sequence that doesn't have homology to anything known? Some of that may be coming from a lot of the new advancements on the de novo protein design side. So on the right hand side, there's three papers that came out all in like within a couple of months early this year. And they're all talking about significant advances in designing totally de novo protein structures that are capable of, of achieving some stated goal on the part of the researchers which is incredibly powerful technology. But from the pr perspective of a DNA synthesis company, how am I supposed to look at these totally novel sequences and make a judgment call about whether they can be used to cause harm or not? It's certainly difficult to do on the DNA se sequence side. Um, and the tools to sort of predict protein structure are really computationally intensive and not always all that accurate. So we really need to kind of invest in tooling and algorithmic capabilities that help kind of keep the ability to do biosecurity risk assessment in line with our ability to actually do these kinds of de novo designs. And the fifth uh, element here, I think, is, is incredibly important. And this gets back to a, a point that was raised in the keynote this morning, which is add security training to our scientific uh, curricula. So as researchers are coming up through their scientific training, often they're given ethics training, which is incredibly important, but they're not really trained to think about um, how their research might be misused. And we see that a lot at Twist directly because we, um, when someone orders a pathogen from us, we reach out to them and say, you know, do you know what you ordered? What do you intend to do with this? You know, please describe kind of the background of your lab, your publication history. And we see a wide diversity of reactions to those questions. So we have some users who are very sophisticated in terms of biosecurity, and they're grateful to have that conversation with us. Um, we see other users who are, had no idea what they were ordering and are really grateful that we detected that and, and want to have that conversation with them. And then we see a, a fairly large group that actually are, are annoyed at being questioned about their research and the propriety of their order. And so I think that that comes down generally to kind of a lack of awareness around the importance of security in biological research. Um, and so including in the curriculum for scientific training background on kind of the history of biological weapons, how to think through the security implications of your own research, I think that that could be an incredibly important addition. Um, and I've listed there two um, really great efforts um, in this direction. We'll just recap the, the five recommendations or, or asks um, and thank you all for your attention and for the invitation to address this group. Thank you.